just just delighted that uh, the the number of people from both North Church and uh, the West Star community turning out for this. Uh, I appreciate your presence and look forward to sharing uh, another a bit of material from After Jesus Before Christianity. Um, as it is our usual practice, I'll try to uh, pull out some material for roughly the first half of tonight and then turn it over to your questions. And like Amy said, if you want to uh, ask the question yourself, you can uh, uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. And if you're uh, more comfortable asking a question uh, uh, in writing, put that in the chat and uh, I'll get it or name, excuse me, or Amy will forward it to me. So um, let me share now my screen. I'm gonna need to go back and forth uh, at the beginning between two uh, different things. So bear with me on that, but I think you'll understand why in a minute. Uh, let me, oh, what happened there? <laughs> Um, Perry, Perry, yes. stop, stop, yeah, stop sharing and, um, then go in and either click that document or the PowerPoint. All, all I can get right now when I, when I tried to, I must have hit something. It says, this will stop others screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Yes or no? And I have to hit one of those. <laughs> um. I'm gonna hit yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thank goodness you're out there, Eric. Okay, now I think we're good. All right. So hopefully everyone now can see uh, my uh, PowerPoint slide as, as is uh, typical, I wanted to, let you know about some upcoming events with West Star. Um, this, uh, what is March 3rd? I think that's uh, Thursday, is it? We've got another free event. Some of you uh, were at uh, last week's free West Star event and uh, uh, it was a great, a great uh, program. This one I'm looking forward to as well, Christianity Interrupted. This is a, a program put together by members of the Western Think Tank. And um, it, it's going to be talking about uh, the, the nature of origins, in this case, uh, Christian origins, and, and uh, what, how, how we understand our origins and their impact on the, the way in which Christians might think of themselves in the 21st century. That's my take on it. I, I have no. Uh, uh, part in, in preparing this, but from what I've read, I think that's a fair representation. Uh, I did say this is uh, free, but you do need to register. And uh, I've put on the left-hand side uh, the website of Westar where you can go and do that. Also, we've got um, coming up March 9th, a, uh, a for pay event on the legacy of uh, the, the great 20th century uh, New Testament scholar, scholar and theologian, Rudolf Bultmann. Some of you will know that name, probably most of you will not, but uh, you see the picture of the presenter down there at the bottom, uh, David Congdon. He's got two books on Bultmann and uh, uh, we're, we're delighted to, to be able to make this presentation on March 9th. So you will, of course, need to uh, register for that. And again, you can go to the Westar site to do so. Well, we are continuing with our discussion of After Jesus Before Christianity. There's a picture of the book. I hope uh, uh, what we've done so far has inspired some of you to buy the book if you had not already. And our, our topic tonight is forming new identities through gender. Uh, and that's uh, one of the uh, 
images that I have used on uh, other occasions. It's uh, from the Roman catacombs. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the face of an early uh, Christian woman. I like that one very much. So this is where I need to uh, switch out of the PowerPoint and go to a Word document. It, there was just too much to try and get onto slides. So bear with me for a few seconds. I'll get this up and then provide a little context. Okay. Um, Amy, uh, will you tell me if you can see that okay? I can, yes. Uh, that's the big good. options. And, and uh, Eric, I, I, I thought I heard you in the, in the background. Yep. That, that looks okay? Looks great. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, let, let me uh, preface this with a, a, just a little bit. Uh, some of the West Star community probably saw a program back in December on this topic led by two of my colleagues, Celine Lilly and Aaron Burncombe. And Aaron, of course, is one of the three authors of the book. And uh, Aaron did this magnificent job on uh, how our, our understanding of gender is socially constructed. And she gave some wonderful examples of that. Um, I did not want to simply uh, duplicate what she had done, but I thought that I would try to uh, come at this from a slightly different angle and talk about gender roles in their uh, social set. And to do that, I'm making use of a table in uh, the book of another West Star colleague, Susan Elliott. West Star people know her best, it's Ellie Elliott. And I put uh, a reference to her book in the chat, so you should be able to see that. And uh, part of, part of uh, Ellie's uh, book it, it, uh, is trying to show that the uh, Roman Empire's social structures uh, were, were important to how the empire itself was configured and how Christian groups at times conform to this, at other times deviate from it. And that's kind of what I want to do tonight, to give you some examples uh, of text uh, from the early Jesus movements and let you think along uh, with me about whether you think this is uh, in sync with these Roman social values or uh, in some ways uh, deviating from them. There's, there's more here than I want to try and read to you but I wanna pull out a few things. Um, the Roman family was, was a bit different than ours. Of course, there was a father and mother and legitimate children, uh, but there were others uh, involved, especially in the uh, freeborn uh, and middle to upper levels of society. That would include often uh, a slave or enslaved persons. And then what, what we might loosely call clients, people who are, uh, we might say, working for the, the family, perhaps as a tutor for uh, the children or, or something like that. But the family system here is built around the head of the family. In, in Latin, the term is pater familias. And it's... It's a very hierarchical, and we should say, uh, male-dominated social system. The head of the house, the patrifamilias, uh, has monarchical authority over the family. He's got big responsibilities, though. He has to protect and support the family. He has to uh, so, uh, set the guidelines and enforce them. Uh, it's, it's a major part of his job, uh, as well as his wife, to try and ensure continuation of the household. That's why you, you see in, in a lot of these Roman families, um, uh, many, many men adopting the sons of other families because they have no heir. And they would uh, 
uh, adopt sons from other families, even though the, the, the potential son still has living parents. Uh, that's what happened, for example, to uh, Augustus, Octavian. He's the son of Julius Caesar, but he was adopted. But that makes him legitimate. Um, and, a, and a key concept here is uh, auctoritas, uh, or authority, the, the, the right to, to exercise rule in one's, one's uh, household. Uh, look at this uh, part of the, the, uh, uh, the document uh, in, in yellow for the mother. Women had responsibility, responsibility for what goes on in the household. Uh, very important to raise legitimate heirs and nurture the children. But she also has to uh, uh, back up the husband and, and uh, help support his authority. Um, you can uh, kind of glance at the uh, responsibilities of other members of the household. Look at some of the uh, moral uh, priorities. Uh, and obviously these depend uh, upon one's position in the house. Obviously the head of the household has to display uh, virtus. Uh, our word virtue comes from this and, and it can be properly translated virtue, but in its most basic sense, it means manliness. This is, this is what a fully formed man is supposed to do. He's supposed to uh, show his strength. He's supposed to be morally incorruptible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the legitimate wife and legitimate daughters uh, have to practice uh, chastity and modesty, uh, obsequium, obedience to the husband or to the father. Our word, yes, our word obsequious comes from this. And, and one, lanificium, Wool working. Uh, there, there were images of various uh, Roman elite uh, working the working the uh, the wool, uh, just as a traditional image of of uh, uh, a a woman doing what she's supposed to do is providing for the family. Um, you can see some other things here. Uh, I, I do think it's interesting that slaves are expected to show. Fidex, which is the equivalent to the Greek word pistis, or in the uh, New Testament, that's a key word for faith. We imagine this in terms of the uh, Roman moral order. They're assuming that this is a timeless and natural order. This is the way things have been and should be. And so uh, the Romans see this as a just uh, uh, system and they see themselves as needing to maintain this, not only for the health of the individual household, but for the empire at large. Um, one of the other things that uh, Ellie Elliott has done very well is to demonstrate how uh, the Roman Empire itself was conceived as a kind of super household with the uh, Caesar, the Augustus, as the pater familius for the whole empire. So I think that's enough uh, to, to uh, go forward. I'm going to have to uh, switch uh, my documents again. So give me just another few seconds. Okay, so we're going to uh, walk through a few passages in the New Testament. This is from the letter to the Colossians. Uh, most of you know that this is uh, attributed to Paul. Uh, 
the great majority of scholars think that it is another pseudonymous document written in Paul's name, probably late in the first century. Anyway, here's the passage I wanted us to consider. Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Perry, love your... Yes. Excuse me. Are you sharing your screen? Because... It's not showing up? No. Oh, okay. Well, then, thank you for catching that. I thought I, thought <clears throat> I had done that. Let's try that again. Thank you, Eric. Is that better? Much. There we go. All right. Let me just make a little adjustment so I can read the whole screen myself. Okay. So now you see it. Wives be subject to your husbands. Uh, husbands love your wives. Never treat them harshly. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is your acceptable duty in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, or they may lose heart. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Now, you'll see along the bottom, I've given you references to some other similar passages from Ephesians, a letter to Titus, and First Peter. So, Let's take a look at this one. This is uh, an especially uh, famous or <laughs> infamous passage, depending on your point of view. This is uh, from 1 Timothy, again, a, uh, a pseudonymous document written in Paul's name. Um, more and more scholars today think it's second century, and I, I fully agree with that. The author writing is Paul advises Timothy that in every place the men should pray, it goes on a little bit, and then adds, I desire also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. Adam was formed first. Then Eve and Adam wasn't deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. When I'm uh, doing this live, I can sometimes see the, the steam coming out of uh, certain people's ears when they hear this. So here's, here's one of these little uh, audience participation, and I'll ask you to put this in the chat. Pretty simple yes or no, but feel free to add uh, any comments you wish to make. Do these examples from Colossians and 1 Timothy seem more closely, closely to conform to that strict father model that I shared, or do you think it deviates from it? And I'll give you a minute and see if I can, I may have to, there we go. Now I can look at the chat. So give you a minute. So one person says conforms, another says strict adherence to the strict father model. Another conform, conforms. <laughs> Give it just another couple of seconds. Sometimes there's a bit of a lag time between when you send it and I, I am able to see it. Uh, what one person writes, it looks like the writer of Timothy thought the Roman thing hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Uh, another person says it conforms to the Roman model. Yeah, uh, th this is this is I think uh, pretty obvious, and, and you folks recognize it. 
Um, it, so in these examples and the others that I didn't read, I just gave you the reference to, uh, you do see uh, these New Testament documents, these documents from early Jesus groups, conforming to that uh, Roman social model. So we, we need to keep that in mind. That's, that's uh, a part of what at least some of these communities uh, uh, did embrace. Let's go on to the next few slides. Uh, I, I know that many in the West Star community have uh, uh, heard about and probably read uh, the Gospel of Mary, and I, I know I've talked about it on some occasions with uh, the North Church folks, but there are probably some out there who are unfamiliar. So very, very briefly, the Gospel of Mary is a fragmentary gospel that we think dates from roughly the middle to the latter part of the second century, so roughly 150 to 200 of the common era. Um, and the, the way it starts out, it, it's apparently a resurrection scene, almost like the, uh, a great commission. The risen Jesus called throughout this little uh, gospel, the savior is speaking to the gathered disciples and telling them to go out and preach the good news uh, and not to add to or take away from anything he's commanded. And then he, he disappears. And we're told that the disciples are extremely despondent and scared. They're, they're, they're really worried that uh, they're going to run into great personal danger if they do this. But then Mary, we presume Mary of Magdala, it, it really doesn't tell us if it's uh, some other Mary or Mary of Magdala, but we presume it's Mary uh, Magdalene. She stands up and encourages the other disciples, uh, reassures them and urges them to uh, do as the Savior commanded. Peter then invites Mary to share anything else that the Savior might have privately shared with, with her because as Peter puts it, he loved you more than the other women. Now, put that away uh, in your memory bank for a moment. He loved you more than the other women. And so Mary proceeds to share a revelation that the Savior gave her. We need not get into it, but uh, anyone who is uh, reading this for the first, second, or third time will think it's a, a bit odd and certainly unusual. Uh, but it, it seems to be a revelation about how the soul has to um, work its way up through various levels of heaven to reach the, the, uh, the goal of, of perfection and become a perfect human being. And after she has uh, said her piece, Andrew, the brother of Peter, says, well, this sure as heck sounds strange. Uh, and uh, did the Savior really entrust this to a woman? And Peter, who had invited her to speak, uh, joins in and, and uh, questions you know, her le legitimate uh, right to speak after, uh, after this. So Mary, of course, is upset. But then Levi comes to her defense. He tells the other male disciples that uh, the, the Savior chose to reveal this to her. So if he made her worthy, who are you to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. And then in a, a bit of a um, reprimand to Peter, that is why he loved her more than us. He loved her not just more than the other woman, but more than us, the male disciples. So rather let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man. That's the metaphor for what we might call the, the uh, saint state in the Gospel of Mary. Let us put on the perfect man and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or law beyond what the Savior said. And we're told that after that, everyone kind of 
shakes their head, okay, and, and uh, they proceed to go uh, teach. Now, a text that I, I know both communities have some familiar, familiarity with are the Acts of Paul and Thecla, because it's a favorite uh, among many of the scholars in West Star and certainly one of mine. Um, for, for the people that have never heard of this or at least aren't familiar with it, again, a, a very brief uh, synopsis. Th this is uh, probably a mid second century uh, document again, and it, it recounts the uh, travels and exploits of Paul, but in this story, a woman named Thecla really takes center stage. She is uh, greatly attracted to Paul's preaching, and in the Acts of Paul and Thecla, front and center in Paul's teaching is a demand, not, a, not a, an allowance for, but a demand for celibacy. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to become celibate. And Thecla seems to embrace this, even though she's uh, uh, engaged to be married. She comes from a, an elite family. And when she breaks her engagement, uh, in her hometown, she is uh, tried and convicted and condemned to death. But she miraculously survives, finds Paul again, tells him she's going to travel with him, and she starts uh, dressing like a man, probably in the first instance to um, disguise her, her uh, female gender and make it a little easier to travel. But uh, that doesn't work. They come to another city. She is uh, nearly raped in public by a, a, a very elite man from the new city. Uh, she's put on trial again, but miraculously survives and has an opportunity to bear witness to the, the, the gospel as she understands it. And some of you have heard me say this, our word martyr comes from the Greek word martus. So she, she bears witness at the point where she could have become a martyr. Uh, in this case, it's the second time she almost becomes a martyr. She uh, uh, converts the household of an aristocratic woman named Athena and teaches them the gospel. She dresses, she goes back to see Paul. She finds him again. She's dressing in men's clothes. And Paul gives her the authority to go preach the word of God, which she does. And the story ends right there. This is a wonderful little, little uh, uh, piece here. It, it uh, was kind of like a, a memento. We know that... Uh, there were pilgrimage sites in Asia Minor and Egypt uh, where people went to celebrate her story. And this is one of those uh, little mementos, kind of like if you go to the uh, Statue of Liberty, you, you're, you're likely to buy one of those little Statue of Liberty uh, tokens. Another story that I'd like to briefly share with you is uh, the martyrdom of Petra. This one, uh, uh, dates, uh, we can date this one pretty exactly to 203 of the Common Era. Um, this is, you know, late in that first 200 year period that the, uh, the book attempts to cover. Perpetua is uh, from North Africa, but she's a Roman citizen. She apparently comes from a, a, an elite family. But she has become a Christian. In fact, there's a big part of this where she just owns that term. We talked about that last week. And she knows that by owning it, she will be executed. And then she, she uh, has several visions. And in one of these, she sees herself uh, as a, a male gladiator. And she is uh, in an arena ready to face an Egyptian fighter. And part of her, her uh, vision or, or dream sees a huge man dressed in purple uh, and gold striding forth. And he tells her that if the Egyptian wins, he'll kill her. But if she prevails, she'll win a branch of golden apples. Well, she, she uh, 
wins the battle in her dream and then wakes up and realizes that, of course, the man in purple and gold was the risen Christ. And she comes to realize that the Egyptian is the devil and that she will be victorious not by killing anyone, but by dying in their arena herself. And the story goes on and describes how that indeed happened. So from these examples, uh, what would you say? Do, do these conform to the strict father model or do they deviate from it? So again, I'll give you a minute to uh, register your comments and answers in the chat. So first, first three or four say uh, these, these texts seem to deviate from the model. By the way, while we're waiting, one of the things I have found interesting about some of these martyrdom stories uh, in the early period, especially before Christianity uh, is legalized in the Roman Empire. Uh, when a woman's involved, women who are uh, able to faithfully uh, go to their deaths are described as having some of those manly virtues of courage, of virtus, et cetera, because uh, they, they, they died nobly. They, they died uh, with constance, constancy towards their faith. Now, one of the things, I, I want to give you a, a little different kind of question. Um, trying to get this forward. Pardon me for a moment. There we go. It, I've heard it said sometimes when I've talked to some, some uh, groups, when I use examples like the Gospel of Mary, Thecla, and Perpetua, uh, people might say, well, those are interesting, but they're, they're not part of the New Testament canon. And so for those of you that, you know, find yourself in the church, does the fact that they're not part of the New Testament canon diminish their relevance for the question of gender, gender roles. So let me give you a moment to react to that in the chat. Uh, one person, th this might have been an answer to the last question, possibly Jesus is the new head of the family. Um, you know, it, it's certainly the case that with uh, those texts like uh, Colossians and 1 Timothy, uh, God, God is imagined as the father of the Christian household, right? Uh, but now speaking to, to this question, do, do, is the fact that these non-canonical non canonical gospels are there does that di diminish their relevance for the question and one person says no um, another person wrote something that i was uh, pointing out both thecla and uh, perpetual had to take on men's traits or clothing to be victorious uh, one writes no, they are proof of gender roles the patriarchy did not want made known. Um, another person writes, the canon was created by the Roman church, which may have selected books that do not conform. 
Uh, were there any other family models, for example, Jewish, Egyptian, or, or pagan? Um, th that, that's a really good question. Um, I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with individual Egyptian society. Um, my, my good friend, Marty Stussy at Christian Theological Seminary, well, ha has said uh, on several occasions where I've been present, that the roles of, of women in the Hebrew Bible are a little different. Um, they're, they're, they appear to be less constricted. Though still, she would add, uh, they have, they might be considered more of a partner with the husband, but they're still expected to um, uh, bear legitimate children and maintain a certain level of household uh, conformity in order for the family to, to prosper. Um, no, one person writes, uh, this is an interesting, uh, interesting way of, of coming at it. It's hard to completely ignore, ignore previous church founders' decision to exclude them. Not the end decider, but a factor when considering them. But then someone quickly adds, nevertheless, they do provide other, other, another glimpse of changing roles in the church. Um, and another person says, it depends on how much authority we afford them. I think probably talking about uh, the non-canonical materials. Uh, then then uh, another person says, if you follow the idea of sola scriptura, uh, scripture alone, the, the great reformation uh, slogan, uh, if you follow that, that slogan, then the, uh, these three documents not being in the canon would diminish their relevance or, or authority. Yeah, boy, this this one's getting a lot of comments. I, I'm uh, I can't wait till we get to uh, week five when we talk about the canon. <laughs> so some of you uh, recognize that uh, this would uh, diminish these documents for those that do take the canon as a, a kind of uh, norm, but others of you would uh, like to see that uh, these, these non-canonical texts get, get their, their due. You know, I come at this, Westar comes at this, you know, very differently, not as members of, of the church, we're independent scholars. And so from the standpoint of the authors of After Jesus Before Christianity, any text written by a member of one of these Jesus groups is evidence for what these early Jesus people thought. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to steal a point from Erin Burncombe uh, when she and Celine Lilly made their presentation back in uh, December. If you ask, did uh, the New Testament enforce these gender roles? The answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Christians weren't of one mind on this. There were differing views. Now, lest you think that the only examples here that are, shall we say, um, deviating from the, the stereotyped gender roles prescribed by uh, the Romans, let's take a look at a handful of things from canonical documents. And so many of you uh, have heard um, folks uh, talk about the importance of Romans 16, Paul's letter to the Romans, where uh, he, he says hello to a bunch of people, but starts with a recommendation. Uh, I'm using um, the scholar's version translation that uh, Art Dewey and uh, Daryl Schmidt, Roy Hoover, and Lane McGahee. Uh, put together. I recommend you our sister Phoebe, who is a leader of the anointed people in Sincrea. And Paul goes on and asks them to 
assist her in whatever uh, undertaking she may uh, require. And I've made the comment many times that Phoebe's probably in Rome, both to carry the letter, we know is a letter to the Romans, and to grease the wheels for Paul's hope for eventual visit. So she's kind of like um, uh, Paul's, Paul's uh, front, front man, as it were. Uh, Paul has entrusted her with a really important task. She isn't just delivering the letter. She's probably uh, reading it and interpreting it to those communities uh, of Jesus' people in Rome. So clearly here, she's very important. And this, this word that's translated here, leader, is in Greek, diakonos. In most other English translations, that's usually translated deacon. It goes on to extend greetings to a, a husband and wife team, Prisca and Aquila. Um, they are a couple that are mentioned a couple of times in the book of Acts. Paul mentions them several times throughout his letters, and it's clear that he is extremely fond of these people and trusts them uh, completely. He even says that they saved his life on one occasion. Um, it's always been pointed out that it's a little unusual for the woman to be listed before the male. And that's when Paul usually does that when he mentions this couple. That might suggest that she has a slightly higher or maybe a much higher social status than her husband. And then say hello to Andronicus and Junia, my compatriots and fellow prisoners. They are persons of distinction among the anointed's envoys. And that word envoys in Greek is apostolo, which we usually translate apostles. Um, and th this is a little bit debated, but I think uh, most scholars would say that the way Paul phrases this, he regards Andronicus and Junia as envoys, apostles, like Paul himself. If that is correct, we've got here a, a, a female name associated with that role. And then there's a, a, a references to several other women say hello to all these people. But you, you begin to get a sense that uh, there are a lot of women that Paul's familiar with who are doing a lot of work for this, this movement and are quite well respected by Paul. There are many other things I could lift up for you, but in the interest of time, I'll just end with this. This is the famous uh, statement from Galatians. So every one of you has been baptized into solidarity with God's anointed, has become invested with the status of God's anointed. You are no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or freeborn, no longer male and female, Instead, you all have the same status in the service of God's anointed Jesus. It's a little hard to see how that Roman model could work if this applied. There's neither slave or freeborn, male and female. It, one of the things I, I, I wish I, I could be a fly on the wall uh, would be in one of these gatherings of Jesus people in, in Paul's communities. I, I would just be fascinated to kind of observe and see how, how people interact. So I think that's a good place for me to stop and give you time to prepare to uh, raise your hand or to maybe ask questions in the chat. Um, while you're doing that, I, I will show you one more picture. This takes us beyond the first 200 years. Um, Ali Katush is a, uh, a scholar who does a lot with uh, the iconography of early Christian art. This is from a, a fourth century sarcophagus uh, from the Vatican Museum, and, and it's clearly Christian. Uh, uh, she can demonstrate with this and many similar ones the Christian character of, of the uh, uh, scenes all around. It, it's a much bigger picture. But uh, in the Vatican, this is listed as the two brothers sarcophagus, but uh, Katushas argued that um, all of the other examples we've got from this period, where you've got a couple in the middle, it's the wife on our left and the husband on the right, 
and the the images are 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 stylized. So you always see the woman with her right hand on the arm or shoulder, and about half the time you see the the, the wife's left hand around the back of the, the the neck and on the husband's shoulder. You don't see that here, and she she argues that these aren't two brothers, but uh, a same-sex couple. Now, uh, that would be extremely interesting if she could uh, uh, find more examples of this to, to make her. Anyway, that takes us beyond uh, the text of the first couple of centuries, but to let you know there, there might be some other gender bending material out there waiting to be discovered. So let me get out of the uh, sharing mode. And see now. Let's see what's. Does anyone want to ask a question? If so, scroll along the bottom. And I think you can raise your hand. I think you have to go to reactions. If you click on reactions, you'll see. There we go. Yeah, you can see how to raise your hand. So, well, some others are maybe getting in, in line to do that. Uh, Robert, I think it is. Robert, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Thanks very much, Perry. Yeah, I'm actually in Australia, so I'm enjoying your talk. Oh, wow. What, what time <laughs> is it? What, what day is it there? It's, it's only in the morning. It's, it's the next day from you. Oh, uh, it's Tuesday here. It's about 11.30 or so in, on Tuesday. Uh, look, thanks very much. I'm really enjoying your commentary. One of the things that's always intrigued me is that I assume Paul was a very conservative man. So how come he is so open to women and, and operating in a different environment in that way? I, I, I don't want to make Paul out to be a 21st central social liberal. <laughs> okay. Um, what we didn't have time to look at some of the more problematic texts in First Corinthians, um, and 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 if we have an opportunity in the future, it, it would be worth our time to go there. Um, I've I've always been fond of another statement of Paul from Second Corinthians, where he says, "We have this treasure in earthen vessels," and I think what you see in Paul specifically, but in the movement uh, larger. There's something uh, in their experience of uh, Jesus, in their experience of being with each other, uh, what they might say, their uh, experiences of the Holy Spirit, that didn't fit the world they knew. They, they wanted something different. They wanted something more uh, life-affirming, life-sustaining. They could not always... Um, imagine how that, that could take what we might call uh, institutional shape. Sometimes they did, but not in every instance. And so I think that's one of the, the, uh, the themes of, of after Jesus before Christianity. We see in these first two centuries, a lot of experimentation. And some of it worked or was it maintained, but not all of it. Um, I think Paul was, Paul would certainly strike a lot of us as conservative, but I think in his day, uh, he's he's more socially radical than many. Uh, and and I think one of the things that we have learned about Paul is that uh, the gospel of Jesus the Anointed is for him the antithesis of the gospel of Rome. And and so I'll I'll just stop right there. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Thank you very much. And and we're delighted to have you all the way from Australia. We by the way, we are working on getting a, a program out there. So stay tuned. Who who else wants to ask a question? Or or oh here, here's one. I've got a couple in the chat. Let's see. Oh wow. Yeah. So Frank writes, so how did the patriarchal Roman model win the Christian model of an ideal family? Um, 
it goes on a, a little uh, further, but I think that's the, the basic gist of it. Well, like I've said, um, some of these groups weren't as uh, inventive, experimental as some others. There were uh, some groups who uh, understood the good news in ways that uh, for them more easily fit with uh, the, the Roman model. I, I'd, wanna, I'd wanna add this, um, and, and I can see this in First Peter. I didn't read it, but uh, First Peter does contain some advice similar to the Colossians. And you might recall last week, I pointed out that whoever the author of First Peter was, probably writing in the late first century, uh, maybe early second, he's writing for communities that either are currently undergoing or very likely to, to uh, be undergoing some sort of harassment from their neighbors. Um, if you are a minority group, and First Peter communities, they think of themselves as exiles and aliens, strangers literally in their own land. If, if, you, if you are a minority in your own community, you are, you're, you're going to have to do an interesting kind of uh, a dance. On the one hand, you've got to maintain those things that mark your group out as unique, special. What makes you a follower of Jesus? But on the other, you're going to be looking for ways to reduce friction and tension with the larger society to the degree that you can. And you see that going on in First Peter. Um, I heard a member of uh, uh, the local Sikh community oh, about, about uh, three years ago speak at the University of Indianapolis. And um, the, the, the gentleman was very gracious and a wonderful spokesperson for his community. But over and over again, he, 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 he said, we, we, our customs may be uh, different. We may look a little different from you, but we're Americans. We, we love America. We value the American constitution. And all of that I'm sure is true, but he was, he, he's walking that tightrope, right? We're proud uh, Sikhs, but we conform to what you folks would expect of a quote unquote good American. And I think something like that is occasionally going on, maybe not all the time, but, but certainly in passages like First Peter. Um, one more thing to be said for that. There, there, the, the move toward uh, the Roman model of uh, the family, the household becoming, shall we say, more the norm even within the Christian groups, I think really uh, increases over time. And especially after the fourth uh, century, when Christianity is legalized, what happens? You have this, uh, uh, this big movement of the, the Roman elite converting to Christianity because, well, the emperor is Christian. And so it would behoove me to get on the same page with the emperor. And so uh, I think you've probably had a lot of people just converting uh, 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 as, a, as a way of pleasing the emperor. There's a whole lot more we could uh, say about that, but I, I want to move on to some of the other questions. So thanks for, for that question. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Reverend Joy Ellen asks, are there any known instances of traditionally married leaders with male consorts? Um, I want to be sure I understand you correctly, Joy Ellen. So if, if, uh, if you uh, don't mind raising your hand, I'll call on you if you prefer to put it in the chat again. Uh, that'd be fine. But you're talking about a, um, a married man. And I presume, but I could be wrong, a married 
man who is a Christ follower, uh, who also has a male consort on the side. Uh, if, if you're asking that, I don't know the answer. Um, someone uh, in, in my, yes, she says, yes, that's what I'm asking. Thank you for, thank you for uh, responding. I, I don't know. Um, I will, I will ask around. Uh, I'm sure there's someone who, uh, if there is such an example, uh, can, can tell me. Um, Keith writes, uh, Stephen Patterson's The Forgotten Creed has even more analysis of Galatians 3. Yes, he certainly does. It's a fine book. Uh, I think it helps us to see how some of the details of the ancient world that after Jesus before Christianity outlines. Uh, yes, I, that's, that's a, a book I would uh, uh, recommend to you. Uh, St Stephen's another West Star colleague. Uh, that book won, I think it was the 2019 Graymeyer Award as uh, uh, best uh, a book in, uh, uh, I, I think it's religious studies, uh, it might be uh, early Christian studies, but it's a very prestigious award and I, I would highly recommend that. Um, oh, uh, here, here's one from, from uh, Liz. Yes, Liz, I appreciate this question. Uh, going back to that reference to Junio uh, in Romans 16, uh, Junio and Andronicus being uh, among the uh, foremost among the uh, envoys of the anointed, was it the name Junio mistranslated as the masculine Junius for centuries to try to deny that a woman had been an apostle? Yes, <laughs> you got that right. Um, you don't see that so much anymore, but yes, once upon a time, that was a, a, a convenient way of dodging that. Uh, um, someone asked about a title, could we put it in the chat? And I, I, I think you might be asked, this person, Christina, might be asking about uh, Stephen Patterson's book. So I'll, I'll put that title in the chat. Um, uh, Keith, who, who wrote about it, said that only to me. So I'll put that in. Um, let me, while I'm doing that, see if there's anything else. We are just about at the top of the hour. Let me send this to everyone. Okay, hope everyone can see that. Well, everyone, thank you again. I, I just uh, appreciate so much your presence. I hope that what I've done has uh, kind of helped you with uh, some of the insights of the book and some of the uh, potential of the book to stir conversation and, and our imagination. And uh, I look forward to doing this with you again next week.